Hello and welcome to another episode of Fellowship in Essential Oils. This week, it's time to explore time. How are oh, you? Oh, get you with your puns. I like oh, it. I, know. I like it. I was all. I was going to use all we have is time, but yours is better. I, I, we, we can run with both of them and see how many times we can fit time into <laughs> this, this podcast. People get irritated and stop by the end of it. But this is a really interesting essential oil. Um, how people talk about it and how I find it, I, I find sometimes a bit of a discrepancy in it. Sometimes people refer to it as being this nice, soft, gentle kind of plant. But I still feel we talked about oregano a couple of weeks ago and I find time to be a little bit on the aggressive side as well. Do you find that? I think there's a yes and no answer to that. Um, so, what, so what I'll say to people is we're going to talk about time today. But if you want to know about the properties, like from a from a chemical point of view, I'd almost say go and look, go and watch the oregano one mm. because we talk so much about carvacrol in there, and carvac- carvacrol is one of the main constituents. Um, but thyme is one of those plants that there are so many different sort of chemotypes of it. For example, if you have a look at, um, I, I was uh, genuinely enough looking at Peter uh, Peter Holmes's book Aromatica. He's got uh, he's got about ten different ones in there. This ran sites, uh, I think eight different ones, and of course these are just like the ones that are commercially available. And the, the chemistry changes so so much based on where it comes from, and it is most definitely a phenolic oil you know as you say very high in, in carvacrol very high in uh t-mol. so they're really strong powerful hot aggressive chemicals but i agree with what people say is gentle oil and it is one that i use for people who are in a weakened state and so yeah just to stress that probably i personally won't talk well i'm not going to talk about carvacrol as a constituent um, because I do so m- much in the oregano one, I think it's mm. really um, interesting to understand it from a mythic point of view, this oil, rather than from a chemical one. Yeah, we'll definitely dive into that for sure. So sometimes time is described as the softer sister of oregano. Would you agree with that term? Yes, except I would say brother. <laughs> a brother. Oh, you find, you find time to be a masculine oil. I do, yeah. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> so I tend to reach for time as a bit of a, you know, oregano. I reach for oregano when I call oregano the Terminator. When I'm feeling lousy, I'm like, right, something needs to come in and just wipe out whatever's dragging me down. And I will use oregano for, say, a period of five days, and that's the, the total period, and I'll give my body at least five days rest. Whereas time, I feel more comfortable using that over an elongated period if necessary, and when necessary, and that type of thing as well. But some people really rave about time and its immune benefits. Is it something you would use immune-wise? Yes, it definitely is from the chemical point of view. Um, However, to me, it's a convalescence oil. It's for somebody who has gone through an awful lot and they've lost their fight, and it's what kind of builds the the spirit again to be able to Mm. do that fight and actually what's interesting is when you look at it from it's like etymological point of view and we we, like it's uh i mean the binomial nomenclature changes from species to species but we'll say it's thymus vulgaris we'll say it's that one um thymus um in greek means a smoke or a spirit so we can definitely see how it would be like used for uh, smudging, like smudging yes. and, and cleaning yeah. the environment. But um, the this spirit that they talk about is, for example, like a spirited debate or a spirited stallion. So how this idea of there is spirit in them, mm. and it's very much related with. Um, to the breath and to the blood but it's not a somatic feeling it's like as if the spirit has come back and bought back the the breath bought back the blood and there's this idea that the 
um, the, the spirit, the thymos, pushes the spirit out to the extremities. And so how you get the idea of the circulation being better, the breath being better, the the fight after being ill for such a long time and being close to the end being better. And this is how it was used uh, in ancient Greece and in Rome um, for, they took it with them on marches. The centurion would be in charge of the time. And if people were, and so they, I like the idea of he's in charge of the time, left, right, left, right, left, right, but he's also got the time. Um, and when it was, when they were close to breaking, then the time would come out. And it's, it's, it's always uh, associated with courage, bravery, and steadfastness. Mm. Now, talk to me a little bit more. You mentioned about helping bring back the breath. I've had a couple of customers that have like, I need time and I need it now. It's the only thing that will help to, you know, they've normally got some kind of respiratory complaint and they're like, I time is, everyone needs time. Why, yeah. why, why is it so powerful? Well, it is antimicrobial. Um, yeah. You know, there's T-mol's antimicrobial, Carvacrol's antimicrobial, so is parasimine. Between the three of those, and if you're looking at something like um, Timus serpalium, which is like the wild creeping time, or lemon thyme, for example, then you've got limonene in there, again, antimicrobial. So tremendous from that point of view. But just this idea of, of frankincense slows the breath, doesn't it? Mm. Um, the um, time restores the breath. It's Got almost you. like, you know, how you can't catch your breath sometimes. Um, or... Um, you have to something somebody says something shocking to you and you realize oh god i've got to remember to breathe it's taking mm -hmm. your breath and those sort of moments leave cellular imprints i think um and the the time is very good at being able to go we'll lift you <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. And I think you, you, you nailed an important point there, which I think is worth kind of repeating as well, that you said frankincense helps to calm the breath, whereas time kind of brings the breath back. Because a lot of the time we go, oh, respiratory complaints, that oil, or sore muscles, that oil. But you've got to kind of go, well, what, what's the problem with the muscle? What's the problem with the breathing? What's the problem with the circulation? Because different oils will do different things to that system, won't they? Yeah. Um, and And really, I couldn't, I haven't even bothered going down the, the avenue of looking at it scientifically because I don't need to because sometimes it's it's enough to just know in your body, isn't it, to have that recognition of, of that's how that's going to work. And so, if, uh, like I say, somebody who is really worn out who maybe has um, long-term stress or has been convalescing for a long time or has been caring for somebody for a long time, but also... I think there's definitely a, 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 a nature of, well, there's another aspect of this spirited smoke thymos thing. And it's mm. about recognition. And actually there's quite a lot of detailed um, like discussions within the early democracy about how one should recognise somebody else's status. And it doesn't necessarily mean one should recognize the emperor or the recognize the king but somebody should recognize somebody else's efforts around you and mm. so and what's interesting is uh, mom years ago had already written something similar to this in the garden of eden how she'd said like for people that do the filing or the really basic stuff that's dead important but nobody really remembers yeah. this idea of being worthy um, and that is exactly what the thymos means, the idea of understanding that, that, that everybody has a role and everyone's important. And that's that's healthy. If somebody has been in working in a in an office or a, or a business where they've been the bottom rung for a long, long time, that can become very depressing. Um, yeah. And so whilst, again, we wouldn't necessarily say it's an antidepressant oil, if, the, if it were working on that level, I definitely think it would be an antidepressant oil. Yeah, amazing. Um, now, 
it, it has a long history of being, like you've mentioned Greece and Rome, and I know it was used in Egypt. Um, I found one bit of literature saying that ladies in the Mediterranean would embroider time sprigs and bees on scarves as a magical amulet of attraction as well, yes. um, which I found quite interesting. Yeah, and actually the other sort of medieval thing, so you imagine that the we're going back to sort of the time of the, the knights, and around in twelve hundred, something like that, and you've got the knights jousting. And when the ladies wanted to uh, attract the attentions of a knight, they would uh, embroider time onto a little handkerchief or a kerchief, as we would say in old English, and drop it for the knight, and that would be his favour. And he would take that with him, and that would be her way of saying, "I'm sending my spirit with you to sustain you to be for your valour," you know. But yeah, I rather like um, this idea of um, the association with bees and time because they do love time. And even before I had bees, we collected times um, and we actually made a time clock, which was successful for about a year and a half, but not not for very long. I didn't water it enough. But so we had it in like 12, 12 cent, uh, um, sections of different times. Uh, and bees do love it, but also it's... Um, Timol is probably the most con important constituent for bees at the moment because this varroa mite that um, is attacking them all, like the parasite that's wearing them down, uh, Timol, Timol kills it. So, yeah, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm just still stuck on that idea of I, I love these old traditions of like a woman dropping a handkerchief a to kind of sit, to, her chief to, to signal her interest and I kind of think I'm trying to imagine that happening in, in this day and age and someone be like oh you just dropped your snotty tissue you know COVID, uh, <laughs> exactly yeah a man <laughs> might run the other way rather than you know keep it with him and that type of thing but yeah the, the romance of the past but I know right it's beautiful isn't it yeah now before we dive into these deeper aspects um sometimes I think we take for granted the different chemotypes of of an essential oil. Can you can you just give a bit of a an, an explanation of what that exactly is referring to? Oh, yeah. So as long as you don't ask me to tell you the different chemical uh, versions, yes, I can do that. So like if we were talking about it in a in a plant, we would say a different phenotype. And the easiest way to recognize that is to think about lavender. So sometimes we all like our lavender oil is taken from the purple ones. Um, that just have like seeds on them. But most people recognise that there is also like a papillon version that's got like feathers on the top. Mm. So that's a different phenotype. So it's a, it is a lavender, but it's a different subspecies of lavender. Um, but when we talk about a chemotype, it means that um, this subspecies also, when it makes an essential oil, will have different chemistry. So yeah. the... Um, so it's difficult from a from a point of view of talking at, at yours and my level because the the chemistry will uh, change from phenotype to phenotype, but also from uh, country to country uh, because of the soils different from year to year because of the um, the sun and the rain and obviously the no not obviously actually so to explain for people who don't know that uh, um, what we have in, in a bottle of essential oil is actually called secondary metabolites. And the what happens is the plant doesn't need those for respiration. That's just, the, it, they're chemicals that it makes to make its life easier. And, I do, and interestingly, to respond to stress. So that stress might be good, because bear in mind, it's rooted to the spot. So even if like the sun comes and beats down and beats down and beats down, it can't go to the shade. So it needs to change its chemistry to deal with the lack of water. Likewise, it might rain and it might go, I can't go and get my wellies. Got to yeah. deal with something with too much water. But also it might be that there's like um, a caterpillar that keeps attacking it or a weevil that keeps attacking its roots and particularly phenols, which is what we're talking about in um, in time, the, they usually do something to make their leaves bitter, so, so it goes 
oh, I don't want to eat that again. Or, which is my favourite wickedness, go uh, they um, change their hormonal balance so that the um, butterfly or, or what have you eats it, but then it changes the butterfly's balance so it can't lay any more eggs. So, therefore, the next generation can't attack, which I think is so, so, so clever. Wow. Um, um, or my very favourite, beta caryophylline not in time as as much as I can remember, but um, maize plants, so like sweet corn maize plants, uh, secrete beta caryophylline when a particular kind of weevily thing has eaten too much of their roots. And this beta caryophylline goes out as a chemical messenger through the soil to say to another creature that eats these weevils, come and sort this out, I need time to recover. And it's just phenomenal, isn't it? Amazing. Um and then, of course, we've got the chemicals, the volatiles that go out into the um, air to attract pollinators. And actually, that, amazingly, I don't know how I did that, and we never talked about that. So that was a tremendous segue to something I wanted to read you from, A Fragrant Mind. So it's, a, it's about uh, infrared radiation, which I thought was really interesting. It says the aroma molecules which rise up from a cornfield can be detected by moths between 500 to 2,000 feet above. This remarkable perception was once attributed entirely to the, mon the moth's sense of smell. But now it's thought moths also recognise the infrared radiation produced by the aroma mo molecules. So the aroma produces radiation in its own right. The scientific field of infrared spect uh, try again spectrophotometry spectrophotometry maybe was discovered by the 19th century Irish genius John Tyndall who aside from discovering why the sky is blue found out that infrared radiation is absorbed by the essential oils of patchouli sandalwood cloves lavender rose lemon thyme rosemary, spikenard and aniseed amongst others. So what significance this infrared uh, factor has vis-a-vis -vis humans is not known. But humans are themselves surrounded by an aura of infrared emanation. According to Tompkins and Bird, uh, Bird in The Secrets of Soil, the subtle molecular odours that surround human bodies are stimulated to radiation by this infrared uh, emission. She says, when I was working in Europe over 20 years ago, it was usual for a therapist to leave the client under an infrared uh, lamp for five minutes before starting an aromatherapy treatment because it was thought to help the absorption of essential oils. This may well be so because infrared includes, it, sorry, improves circulation, opens blood vessels, brings blood to the surface so it can absorb better. On the infrared question, then, we have several factors to consider. Aroma molecules may produce infrared radiation. They also absorb it. Human beings are surrounded by infrared emissions and circulation is helped when they're exposed to more of it. Uh, clearly, there are interactions between essential oils and human beings on the infrared uh, level, interactions that need further investigation, which may one day help to explain their efficiency. So that is The Fragrant Mind by Valerie Ann Walwood, if anybody else wants to read that. But I love this idea that the the time has absorbed the sun. Because mm. I do think this idea of how it pushes the energy out to the extremities for circulation, for breathing, for spirits generally, uh, could definitely be a sun medicine. Yeah, interesting. I just went off, it's not a major tangent, but when we think about the chakra system, and occasionally I refer to this earth star chakra, so we know that the, the base chakra is associated with the colour red, and then if we go down the colour spectrum, the earth star chakra is associated with infrared. So Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. I just want to say one more thing before I forget. So I talk about how I use it on for people who are in weakened states. Um, I also use it for people who are naturally more sensitive. I was going to say weaker, but I don't mean to say that. So, for example, people who have autism or people who are empaths, who 
I carve a crawl in um, in. What just happened to you? Sorry, I sneezed. I tried to hold in a sneeze. Bless you, my <laughs> child. Thank I got you. Know, then. So, like, oregano would be like a slap to somebody with autism or something like that. So, um, yeah, thyme is a much better choice. Yeah. Okay, so let's start diving into this kind of, you've got some mythical stuff that I know you're brimming to share with us. Well, no, that was it, really. This idea of this, this thymos. No, no, I haven't got loads of gods and goddesses this time. But this idea of the, the, the thymos, definitely. Spirited smoke, bring it, we're bringing the spirit back. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay, well, let me share a little bit about um, one thing I find time to be really great for is I kind of, it works really well with a crystal known as malachite. Now, malachite is this beautiful, um, it grows in like green clouds. And when you find it polished or tumbled, it'll kind of have waves of green through it. And its uh, main constituent is copper. And copper is connected to Venus, which is connected to love. But um, malachite is often referred to as a crystal paradise. But I find both malachite and thyme work really well. And I find in oracle readings when I'm using my, like my decks and pulling cards, when time comes up for people, that I normally say, "Is you know, how's life going? And they're like, is there anything challenging at the moment? And the reaction I pretty much always get is, no, nah, not really. There's not much happening. And what I find is time is like this big hand that reaches deep into the soul and pulls up different things that goes right. It's something that you haven't looked at for a long, long time and it's almost become part of you that needs to be looked at. I kind of think it's like a tomato, you know, that we leave in the fridge. Now, we have things that happen to us in life and we may not be able to deal with them directly in that moment. Maybe we need, might need to talk to someone about it that, that night or later that day or, or so on. So it's all right to leave a tomato in the fridge for a day or a couple of days or maybe a week. But some of us, I think, with those emotional tomatoes, we've left them in the fridge for maybe a month, a year, a decade since childhood, and they start to eat away. And time is a really good one, along with this crystal malachite, to draw this up to the surface and to draw it back to the awareness. So that way you can start to deal with it. You can, you know, kind of, like you're saying, it helps with the circulation. It helps to expand everything to the depth, to the um, extent of the spirit in that type of way, so that we can actually authentically deal with it and have have true happiness. And that's why Malachi is called the crystal of uh, paradise because it doesn't sweep everything under the rug and pretend everything's rainbow and lollipops. It actually goes, no, let's deal with the issues so that you can be authentically happy rather than falsely happy. So I think time is a really if if Time keeps coming up for you. If you're drawn to watch this um, episode, if you're, um, if it's, you just have an attraction to it, maybe there's something there, and you're ready to actually go back digging and release that once and for all. I love that, and it's not like an oil I would put in the bath because it no. is hot. Yeah, but I do like bathing with um, with time, mm. and by that I mean. I make little candles with thyme oil and geranium oil. So, you know, you get like little tea lights. Yeah. You put them into, put them on the baking tray, put them into the oven and just let them melt and then put some essential oil into the melted wax, not onto the wick, onto the wet, melted wax. Then obviously when you burn them, um, you have them around the bath and then you get this going on. Amazing. And it's, a uh, yeah, it is very much one of those oils that that kind of goes. Just just take some time. Do one thing at a time. One thing, yeah. at a time, you know. And as you say, that the there will be this idea of putting things away for a while. That does feel mm. appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Another way I I often use it will be um, again. I tend to reach for time more for all that immune support. So that physical, although it does have this powerful emotional healing, um, I just, you know, diluting it with the carrier oil and rubbing it on the soles of the feet at night and then allowing that stuff to come up maybe through your dreams or to bubble up. Because a lot of the time we don't know what things that we've buried and maybe those of us that are a bit more spiritually inclined may be on that journey. But when you look at, uh, you know, I hate to generalise and use terms like the common person, 
many people are just doing the best they can every day and they don't have that time for self-awareness or self-introspection. And a lot of people that are operating from a certain way, not realising that the childhood and what they buried in childhood or that, that, that breakup that really hurt them, that that's actually impacting them on an ongoing level. And I think it's becoming more evident that our mental and emotional states from past and present impact our physical well-being. But I don't think everyone really acknowledges the importance yet of making sure that we are tackling those mental issues or those emotional issues of the past in order to help us be a healthier, well-rounded person as well. So I think time could be really valuable in that essence. Yeah, and I think we shouldn't underestimate how brave that is to do that. Um, mm. You know, it is that's what it is. It's an oil of of, of valor of, and we should use the ancient words. I think it's not it, it it's a, it's valor, it's fortitude, it's courage. You know, yes. um, all of those those things, and I I think that um, it's a really ancient um, medicine time. And I do think that potentially it was one of the very first essential oils. It makes sense that it must have been because it's got such a a good yield and it's kind of like uh, evergreen, depending on what species. They go a bit scraggly, but they, they don't they don't die. So it's always been around for winter coughs and colds for it's always had like the the warming nature of the um for the rheumatism the arthritis the gout um also one thing i should say vermifuge best vermifuge there is so intestinal worms parasites those kind of things tremendous so there's always been a lot of ways to use it for the common person no yeah everybody's had it in their garden they've had they've made teas out of it it is it is the it is really an oil I think for the common person. Yeah. I must say in Australia, it's not like I know it as a culinary herb, but I very, very, very rarely see it being used in anything as a food flavoring these days. Do you, is that the same in England or is it used occasionally in England? Everywhere. It's used everywhere. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's a, it is definitely one of our um, most important herbs. So we would for example, if you have like a, a roast dinner, you'd either have a, um, a sage and onion stuffing or a lemon and thyme stuffing. And mm. so if you have like um, Italian herbs for um, spaghetti bolognese, you'll find it in there. If you have Herbe de Front Provence mm. in there, it is it is one of our most important herbs. Yeah. Mm. Another thing that time is said to be a bit of a marker of is it's meant to be a marker for portals into the underworld and for helping you to access that. And so where it grows, if you're trying to, I don't know, I don't normally try and get down to the underworld, but if you're trying to work out a portal, apparently where the time grows is where where you get into the underworld. Have you heard that before? I haven't, but I tell you what they, what they do say over here, it's where the Fae live. Yeah, the fae yeah. Live, yeah, the fae live in the, the fairy, like, oh, fairy um, lives in the um, time. And I love that because think how little, I mean, have you ever seen a time plant, actually? I have, yes. yes. Yeah. So, the, so for those of you who perhaps are not in Europe, may not have, the flowers are absolutely minute. The leaves are very small. So you really can imagine like fairies just like having a party in it and stuff. And they're such pretty, you know, um, different times have different colour flowers, but a lot of them are sort of white or pink. They're very, mm. very pretty when they come out. I could, it's, I, yeah, the, fa- the, the fae live in there makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what chakra would you associate time with? To me, um, solar plexus. Okay. I would go the heart. Um, it's a bit of a, I'm going to use the word loosely, a vi- bit more of a violent one because it's about healing of the heart. So to allow true heart and true expression, it's really hard to, you know, as we know, really hard to dive into a relationship if you're still holding the pain of relationship past. So it kind of, that's its role that it plays. It works really well at helping to bring up things that need dealing with. I'd even bring in something like birch to help cleanse that away. And you've got oils like geranium and rose that will really help to open the heart. So I work with it with the heart and tend to, you know, dedicate to Venus. Planetary, what would you go? Uh, but yes, I agree with the, I agree with the heart. Actually, the set you saying that. Um, yeah, mm, 
Yes, Venus, but I think more to do with Saturn and Jupiter, I think. Um, mm. The way that life is a drudgery is Saturn and things get cold and achy and boring and dull, this idea of lower rank work, lower rank workers. and But also the way that um, Jupiter is to do with the solar plexus of they are um joined but but also this idea of dealing with authority and dealing with the man i think as well yeah yeah oh no liz we've run out of time the only oh thing we have God. time to talk about now that we've finished talking about time is our master class no, no 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 i want to say one more thing oh okay i'll time. shut up then thing that you do now <laughs> i want to talk about maximum dilution so okay. um there there are contraindications to using time because and you would need to check each one individually um but a lot of them are processed by um drugs um to do with the liver uh so we would always be careful about um liver drugs but also um depending on which time you're using some of them are really really strong and like dermal irritants i would so you, you can kind of go two percent safely but i would always say go one percent not just from a safety point of view but also because you'd be working more on an etheric point of view rather than a physical point of view um and a bit like chamomile is a like a physician's plant in the garden. I don't know if people know that. If you put chamomile between your plants, your other plants will thrive better. Um, mm. I think that it's best to use thyme that way as an essential oil, that it's the physician that makes, that builds the synergy with the others. So, yeah, go low. Don't use too big uh, um, dilutions of it. You may now move on to the masterclass. Yes. Well, I was going to say, one thing, people, we've been talking about these chemotypes. Normally, how you can tell a little bit about chemotypes is it might, might be on the label of a bottle or when you're purchasing it online, um, time, and then it'll go C, T, linalool, and that will right. be something that there's a higher constituent of that in there. Is that, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you do, yeah, for safety, you want to look it up by Latin name. And yeah. a good <laughs> a good essential oils uh vendor should be able to tell you what the ma uh, what the maximum dilution is but the very best place to look is in uh, tisserandon young um essential oil safety for professionals which is an expensive book but it is worthwhile having okay is it time is it, it is time? time now it is time now it's time. it's time to talk about our masterclass our masterclass is coming up in just a few days the link with the discount code is down below our last masterclass for this year we're going everything Christmassy, everything wintry. We're going to talk about a bit of immunity because we've been talking about some immune oils. Uh, and we're going to look also for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, we are going to look a little bit about the summer solstice as well, just to nudge that in there. But most importantly, it's your opportunity to interact with me and Liz and throw your questions out to us. So any questions you have personal, something you've been pondering as we've you've listened to one of our episodes, this is your last chance for 2023. So make sure you grab your Masterclass ticket. And until then, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.